You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliot, talking again today about being alone with God. I made a few suggestions about what you might do if you need help with your quiet time with the Lord. Most important of all is to set a time which is a reasonable hour or a few minutes that you can manage in your schedule. And you and God both know what your schedule is. So I hope that you won't use the excuse that you don't have time for quiet time because God will certainly help you to arrange that if you really want to. Have a time and a place and a posture. Make up your mind if you want to sit, stand, walk, lie down, or whatever, and put yourself in the presence of God. Make an offering of yourself. Sometimes I would call it a ratifying of the surrender that you have once made. And just remind the Lord that He is your Lord and Master, and you are His servant, and you're here to receive His directions. Read your Bible, pray, and my strong suggestion is that you should incorporate hymns also in your prayers because they are so full of prayer. Many of the old hymns of the church are in themselves prayer. And if you're anything like me, you often find yourself at a loss for words. You don't quite know how to say what you want to say. And it's perfectly legitimate to use written prayers. There are many of them in the Bible. Every epistle of Paul has prayers in it. And there are prayers, of course, in the Psalms. The Psalms are practically all prayers. So make use of those. Now, you're not just going to find time. You're going to have to make it, and that does take discipline. One of the things that deters people from praying is the feeling that there's no point in telling God what he already knows. Well, Oswald Chambers, such a down-to-earth, sensible man, has this to say. To the rationalist, it's ridiculous to pray to God about everything. Hiding behind this ridicule is the devil, who wants to keep us from knowing the road to take when the crisis comes. Hezekiah knew the road. In his prayer, Hezekiah tells God what he knows God knows already. That's the meaning of prayer. I tell God what I know he knows in order that I may get to know it as he does. It is not true to say that a man learns to pray in calamities. He seldom does. He calls on God to deliver him, but he does not pray. A man only learns to pray when there is no calamity. And the passage to which he refers about Hezekiah is from Isaiah 37. Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, O Lord Almighty God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen to all the words Sennacherib has sent to insult the living God. It is true, O Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste all these peoples and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. Now, O Lord our God, deliver us from his hand, so that all kingdoms on earth may know that you alone, O Lord, are God. Now there's an example of a written prayer. If you would like to use that one in your own prayers, I think it would make sense. You could fill in other situations than Sennacherib's attack. But it is Isaiah 37, verses 14 to 20. Hezekiah is telling God what he knows, God knows, already. St. Gregory said, By asking, men deserve to receive what the all-powerful God has decided will be obtained through prayer. 
men deserve to receive what the all-powerful God has decided will be obtained through prayer. But we are told to ask, aren't we? Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. Another aspect of prayer is listening to God. I don't expect God to speak to me in an audible voice. I don't expect him to put handwriting on the wall or give me any stars of Bethlehem or pillars of fire. I really don't expect that he's going to send an angel with a special message for me. Now, he might do that. I'm not ruling out those possibilities, but it's never happened in my experience. And God will have different ways of dealing with different people. But we need to be very cautious about saying, the Lord said to me, or the Lord told me, unless you're taking the words directly from Scripture. And even that, of course, can be hazardous, as in the case of the man who was determined to use the hunt and punch method, where you open the Bible, punch your finger down on a verse, and decide that that's what God is saying to you. And so this man punched his finger down, and the verse was, Judas went out and hanged himself. So he thought, well, that can't be what God wants me to do. So he flipped over a few more pages, stuck his finger down, and the verse said, Go thou and do likewise. You can see the hazards of that method of guidance. You will not find time. You have to take time to be holy, as the old hymn says. Feed on his word. Make friends with God's people. Help those who are weak, forgetting in nothing his blessing to seek. Those are the words from the hymn of Take Time to Be Holy. And I love what George MacDonald says. This has given me pause many times. Many things that God would gladly give us, things even that we need because we are, must wait until we ask for them, that we may know whence they come. When in all gifts we find him, then in him we shall find all things. That's probably an explanation as to why we don't receive some of the things that we want, because it hasn't even crossed our minds to pray about them. And many things that God would gladly give us, things even that we need because we are, must wait until we ask for them so that we may know from whom they come, and when in all our gifts we find him, then in him we shall find all things. I mentioned yesterday Scripture Union Materials. That's a very fine Christian organization that can supply all kinds of devotional helps. One of the things we have to learn is to accept delays. God is not always on our same time schedule. Usually, he's not. John Wesley kept journals. Jim Elliott kept a journal, which is still in print. John Woolwich, a well-known Quaker back in the 1700s, kept a very fascinating journal. He was one of the ones who was very strongly against slavery and did everything he could to stamp out slavery, even in the northern states. I recommend that you read the journals of such people and biographies, you find that these were people who did manage to arrange silence and solitude. Train your children to be quiet. Give them a quiet hour in the afternoon, if possible. Just a time when they have to learn to amuse themselves without making any noise, without running in and out to the bathroom, without coming into Mama's room, because Mama may be taking a little siesta herself, and teach them that this is their time to learn to be alone. They cannot be talking to anybody else, and I know that this works because my daughter does this with her children. She has a family of eight children, and at two o'clock, more or less, in the afternoon, they have quiet hour, and it really is a very important kind of training early in life so that you can know what to do with silence and solitude. One question asked perhaps more than any other about the subject of prayer is why God says no. I have found seven reasons at least in Scripture, and I'm sure there are many more. I'll give them to you just briefly for you to think about. 
One, for the sake of others. Two, for God's glory among his people. Three, because he has something better to give us. Four, because we are harboring sin in our lives. Five, because we are not asking in his name. Six, for reasons of his own, which we need not know. And seven, in order to lead us not into temptation. Now just to go back to number one, for example, God said no to Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane. If he had said yes and spared him from going to the cross, you and I would not have been saved. If Paul had not had the thorn that God allowed him to have in the flesh, you and I would have missed out on that great lesson, my grace is all you need. We pray, lead us not into temptation. It's legitimate to pray that. God tells us to pray that. But sometimes he allows us to be tempted in order that we may be strengthened spiritually.